Hello and welcome everyone. We have um, many more people who signed up that aren't here yet, but we are going to get started and um, just as people arrive, I'll be letting them into our presentation for you today. Maria is going to kick us off. Awesome. Ana Maria. <laughs> Ana Maria Maria, fine. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. We are so happy that you found us and that you chosen to join us this evening. We've been thinking hard about how um, the work that we've done together as a collective can be of support to you right now. So we, in, in that thinking process, we thought that um, well, what we practice, which is the unschooling way of learning, um, in various ways, we all have our own type of style. We um, thought that the unschooling process can be actually um, very supportive when you have to take a year of this unknown that we're living right now. So we wanna share that with you. Um, and we'll go through a little bit of a slide presentation to share some of those pieces with you and talk a little bit more in depth about those. And then we're gonna spend the rest of the afternoon or the rest of our time together doing a Q and A. Um, so feel free to um, send your questions as they're coming up for you on the chat. Um, we're gonna do a little bit of a Zoom etiquette overview, which is to ask you to please turn off your camera during the slide presentation as well as your mic. Um, as, again, you can use the chat for sending your questions. And once we begin our Q&A, we would love to be able to have a full gallery view of all of you and have a dialogue together. And that's a point where you can turn on your camera if you would like and your mic as well. So we're gonna go right in and do some introductions. Yeah, that's our introduction. <laughs> Hi, well, we are the Unschooling Squad, and my name is Diana Kluth. I'm 49 years old and collaboratively unschool uh, two daughters, age 9 and 12, with my partner and my community. I could not do this without community. Um, we've been unschooling since the kids were born, basically, before we knew what unschooling was, before we knew what attachment parenting was, um, just following our heart and listening and observing um, the needs of our growing child and then children. And at first we went against our intuition and fell into line and in exploring school options uh, when our eldest was about two, uh, yeah, two. And um, the experiences never felt right. We pulled our daughter out of three schools, three different part-time drop-off pre-kindergarten programs and schools and teachers switch teachers um, in one school for a year until we got really lucky at a public school next door and with this lovely grandmotherly in Egyptian Muslim woman who just was a treasure and who treasured and respected children and nurtured their sovereign power and intelligence. But then, you know, with the exception of that experience, we were all dissatisfied and unhappy with school and we ended up starting uh, to homeschool full time uh, after a week of sitting in on the kindergarten uh, class with a new teacher. And so we researched homeschooling and dabbled um, in different ways of being present with our children, but quickly found our mirror in the basically indigenous principles of radical unschooling and learning by being in community with respect for every life. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Lisa Gillard and I have three children who are 13, 11, and seven. And with the exception of my eldest who went to nursery school for about six months, um, my children have all been home and they've all been unschooled all along. Um, when I took my daughter out of nursery school, she was unhappy there and I was, you know, not, not too pleased. I had sort of signed up hoping to find a community of friends because I had newly moved to this area and I didn't know anybody. 
and I didn't find the connection I was looking for and my daughter was unhappy. And in the course of searching for a different school, I literally stumbled upon a homeschool meeting at one of our local libraries and everybody was so lovely and the energy in that room was so inviting and peaceful that I just thought, you know, I need to know more about this. And um, some of the women directed me to a John Holt book uh, called Teach Your Own and I read it and from that moment on we have never looked back. We've been unschooling and um, happily doing so with my partner Nate and um, yes lots of friends. This is a great community. Um, yep and I'm learning as much from my kids as I think they're learning from just living and evolving in the world. Thanks Lisa. As I've mentioned before my name is Ana Maria and uh, we have three kids who are ages eight going on 45. Uh, 13 and 16, about to be 16, our oldest. And um, we've had an interesting journey through homeschooling. I actually come uh, from an education background. I was working in New York City at the public schools, um, which I had an amazing experience at, amazing mentors, um, colleagues, um, working with young people was one of my favorite, favorite things to do. Um, when my first child was born, my husband and I had already been in conversations about the education system, what we were seeing. We both worked with young people at different times and just our experiences of what was happening there, um, particularly around um, serving um, Black and Indigenous and people of color in that space. We really felt like um, it was really not supporting them as much with the curriculum, um, just with the structure. And having been part of the bureaucracy myself and just being involved with that, it just became really challenging to see a future of um, trying to raise a liberated mixed child, indigenous and black and Latin and Latinx. Um, and we wanted to have the space to work through that and explore that. Uh, so that happened really on, really early on for us. And so as soon as our child was born, we started. Um, of course, that was an ebb and flow of an experience, and we'll probably get to that as we share some of um, what's in the, in, the slide, in the slide presentation. But what I will say is that I came to unschooling when I really began to feel some tension in our home with everything that we had been doing. And, and we went through a lot of amazing experiences and amazing learning together, but there was a point in time where the tension just seemed to get really constricting on all of us. Um, and we had to explore a new way of, of working together again as a collective. And you will learn that that is part of homeschooling. It's really an ebb and flow of figuring out um, how to be a collective in a community that is learning together. So with that, I want to transition into our slideshow. And um, today, we're going to focus on the nine unschooling touchstones that we thought would truly support you during this time. So even though um, we are all unschoolers, and even though that might be a type of philosophy that you are not considering at all for this coming year, but have heard of it or are interested in, we feel like these particular touchstones are essential for any situation that you're going into as a family for a learning experience, a collective learning experience. We find that all these touchstones will support you in some way, whatever, whatever style of learning you choose. Even if you choose virtual learning through your school system, these touchstones, I feel, could really be of support to you. We feel, as a collective, could really support you. So we're gonna jump right in, and each of us are gonna take one of them. So please bear with us as we work through those, but we hope that what we're sharing through those will really be of service to you. Oh, we don't have your mic, Deanna. <laughs> Sorry, I okay. unmuted myself for, for, for your focus. Um, we're gonna move through these very quickly so that we can get to um, spending a lot of time taking your questions and, and really being in conversation about this. Um, so 
I'll begin with, with trust. Um, so as Maria said, we use these touchstones daily um, in their, their guiding philosophies and, and remind us, and it's been so great working collaboratively with, with uh, our support group, creating the support group to re-examine and come back to these touchstones um, and how it helped helps me through difficult times. Um, and we, we put trust at the top of the list because this can be a foundational mantra to get me through, to get us through any moment of constriction when you feel compelled to use coercive controls to impose your will upon your child for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, trust children. Their minds are flexible. They are not limited by what adults have been taught is possible. Children are fully human. They are born whole. They are born with a drive for self-determination, intelligence, and learning. And this time that we find ourselves in um, really challenges us to build, um, to maintain strong and connected relationships. And basing those on trust is so important to us. Um, you know, it, it has helped me to let go of control, uh, focusing on trust, has helped me to let go of control in a way that results in deepening the connection with my children as they learn that I am trustworthy. As I return to trusting them more and more, they put down their armor, their resistance, their body and mind's defenses against my subterfuge. And so their minds become more receptive to integrating the learning that their experiences are giving them. As I trust, my own nervous system resets and calms down and I begin to move uh, into a more receptive state uh, and to the learning that my experiences and my children are giving me. So I begin to see that my children are actually learning, you know, what they're learning is far more rich and, and, and being integrated in a way that curriculum, any curriculum that I could have developed would have, uh, exposed them to. And I could not have instilled, for example, a love of chemistry that my nine-year-old has by offering her just curriculum alone. It was the trust I had in her to find her own way. And as she was supported by me in the interests that led her to her passion. In a nutshell, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but we'll just move on really quickly through this list and then we can talk about it. Lisa, I believe you have learning happens everywhere. Right. Yes, and because we're on time, I'm actually gonna read through my notes so that I stay on point because I do have a tendency to <laughs> talk and talk. All right, so. Learning happens everywhere. Learning and schooling are not the same thing. Schooling is a version of learning that happens under specific constructs. It is a subset of learning. Learning also happens in the kitchen, in the museum, in the street, playing a video game, having a conversation, watching YouTube, reading, etc. Learning is an intrinsic human capability. Children are learning all the time. We all are. In this new um, chapter of education, right, this year of pandemic homeschooling, it might be helpful to reconsider what you know or think of as learning because teaching is not necessary for learning to happen. Learning does not only happen at school or during special times of the day. Learning happens everywhere. Starting with the idea that learning is an intrinsic human capability, I want you all to think about the last time you learned something new. Were you in school or sitting in a classroom or were you scrolling on your phone or watching a video on YouTube or talking to a friend? Why did you decide to learn about that thing? You probably became interested in the topic or needed to learn about it because it was of value to you in the moment. Um, hey, look at you all learning about learning right now, right? You know, something changes in your life and here you are exploring. Can you pause Lisa? I'm sorry, one second, honey. We just have a new person. Did we get to 
to um, put the mic off for a moment. Diana, were you able to do that? Okay, sorry. Yeah, Welcome mean, everybody. We're well, asking then, everybody to shut their mic and their, com and their camera for now. And when we're done with the slide presentation, we will welcome you in. Thank you. Sorry, Lisa. That's okay. All right. Um, why did you decide to learn about that new thing? Um, you probably became interested in the topic or needed to learn about it because it was of value to you in the moment, right? You're learning about homeschooling now. Um, how did you learn about it? Maybe you did some research on the internet, gathered resources, websites or videos, articles or blog posts, books, or maybe you sought out a mentor or a guide with experience in this topic. You started learning with whichever resource most attracted you, and you might have switched to one or more resources as you felt best supported your curiosity and exploration at the moment. Hi, sweetie. My son just came in. Hi. Oh. <laughs> as you researched and learned about this new topic, did it lead you to other interesting topics and subtopics that you wanted to explore? Well, listen, I have my mic on this time, so I'm going to keep on talking. Huh? Hi, Liz. We got a whole bunch of people listening to your mom. Hi to the people, Liz. All right. Um, kids who are provided with access to a nutrient rich environment where tools of their culture are available to use, along with an engaged adult to chat with, learn in the same way that adults do. Um, I understand that it can be reassuring to follow a curriculum and to have someone else tell you what, when, and how your child should learn. But reflecting on your own experience growing up in a curriculum driven school, did you learn everything that was taught to you? Or is it the information that you learned on your own through your own interest and need that you remember in the long term? These are all things to consider as we're, you're moving into this unknown um, journey of what it might look like to live a year without schooling. With unschooling, we recognize that learning is in everything because we have taken the time to acknowledge the personal interest and need-based learning that we have done simply because we are living in a world where there are always new and interesting things to explore. Humans learn best when they are interested and engaged, when they are supported in exploring their own passions. We learn through living. Learning is in everything. Following a child's unique interests, regardless of the subject or their age, leads to an incredible wealth of meaningful knowledge. They make connections from one bit of information to the next as they explore their emerging interests. For example, an interest in snakes can lead to geography as they learn about where in the world various snakes live, taxonomy as they delve into the classification of various species, biology as they learn the physical characteristics of individual snakes, math as they research the cost of owning a pet snake over the course of its 20 year lifespan, Reading as they browse websites and books for information. Oops, sorry guys, I got out of order here. It's the problem with going on script. <laughs> anyway, maybe I lost it, but here we go. On and on, when they're learning, when they're following their own interest, skills upon skills and knowledge upon knowledge follow. And um, they create a curriculum that is unique to them, that is just so tailored to them and to their own unique interests. And so we, as unschoolers, we, instead of using a curriculum, we know that learning happens everywhere. We know that learning is in everything. And we work to um, enable our children's innate curiosity to explore the things that they're interested in, because we know that that is learning. Thank you, Lisa. Oops, here we are. It's my turn, everyone. I want to talk to you about de-schooling. Um, and I know this is a challenge um, to think about when you are, and when you have, and we all have as well, been embedded in, in the school system of learning. Um, so I'm going to go through reading these points and then share some thoughts I have. Um, let me move my video. 
Take time to confront the internal accultura acculturation of the have to's and should's. Take this time to self-reflect, pausing to look at your motivations and ideas about learning and schooling. Homeschooling does not aim to replicate school within the home, nor does it need to. Value your individual child as a whole human being, one whose interests, wishes, and need for self-determination are just as valid as those of adults. So Lisa did a beautiful job um, writing a de-schooling piece defining and sort of introducing us to the process and that's going to be placed in a guide that's going to be available to we'll, we'll get it available to you guys but we're trying to make it available to our community and, and she did a beautiful job describing that so I don't want to miss her words but I will share some things that for me have been important in my discipline process so first of all we are gonna all need to take some time to reframe how are we going to be present as families? Does this mean that we need to sit for eight hours to ensure that our children get through their work as they have in school? The beautiful thing about homeschooling and unschooling is that the answer is no. You can be incredibly flexible about how this happens. And so the process of de-schooling is really getting into the mindset of being open to exploring those possibilities, of just like picking back on what Lisa said, that, that learning can happen in various ways. So following a curriculum won't necessarily be the only way that you have access to that learning experience. So the de-schooling process is really for you, but also for the child, um, because they're gonna be expecting sort of that same rhythm, rhythm. and maybe you experienced a little bit this spring that they were still sort of um, acculturated in a way to the rhythm of how one experiences learning in a school setting. So you have your 40 minute periods, some longer, and then you take a break and then you go. Um, but in the de-school process, you can actually spend an entire three hours in the forest and cover a wide array of subjects in that time and at the same time, get your exercise, get your energy, get your connection with your peers or with your family. Um, and being able to switch the thought of having to sit down with a worksheet doing biology from being out in the forest doing plant identification is the process of de-schooling. And I also wanted to invite you to think of the qualities of a person that you felt so good learning with. Um, and I think this is, I, I've been thinking about it a lot lately just in terms of what can be helpful to you guys right away as you're trying to make this decision. And for me is this idea of who has been that person in your life where you were around that you learned from, whether it was a teacher, whether it was in a school setting, whether it was outside of school, whether it was within your family, but perhaps there's someone in your life and we all have those people. Think about the qualities in that person. What made that person feel um, so all-encompassing in their, in their passion? Um, so beautiful to be around. What made you feel like you went home with bigger knowledge than what you started with? And what made you feel open to receive that information? I mean, we all had that teacher that we went to class with and we just totally shut down and couldn't even receive what they were giving. But there were those that you just were hungry for what they had to give. And so think of those qualities. And those qualities can actually frame this de-schooling process. They can frame how you wanna be, how you wanna partner with your child. And part of de-schooling too is that you don't have to think about yourself as a teacher, as the one that holds all the information. You can think of yourself as a facilitator, as a partner, as a support. Um, so I encourage you to take the time to think about this. Take, a, take, take time 
you have this good month and a half and actually you don't have to start quite in September. You can lag it off a little bit if you are not going to follow the structure of virtual learning through your school system. You and, and you're going to pull your child out of school to homeschool and, and uns or unschool this year. You can start at whichever point your family feels ready. Um, I also want to invite you. Um, I'm going to be talking about this a lot. I'm going to weave it in through all the all the pieces that I'm going to be talking about. We have this beautiful tool within unschooling, um, which fits in every area that we're going to speak about, which is the tool of inquiry. And another way that we talk about that is curiosity. And the tool of inquiry is really about you coming to a place of asking as many questions at any given point. And this could be within yourself or this could be within your context of your family or your relationship with one child that you're trying to support. So inquiry in the process of inquiry is getting very curious about who your child is, about what your goals are as a family this year. What is gonna be incredibly important for you all to focus on? Or what's important for the child A and child B and the, and the father and the mother that has to work full time? What are the goals and what is important for you guys as a collective to, to experience this year? And begin to create a map of that together through that inquiry. Because in that map, you're gonna have so much data about how you wanna live this year together, about how you wanna frame your learning experience. Um, it might even inform if you decide to travel somewhere together as part of your learning. It might inform the way that you schedule things. Maybe one parent takes one child every week to do something with that person just to address one particular interest or one particular goal. So inquiry is really gonna be such a beautiful process that is related to de-schooling because you don't have to just follow the curriculum right now. You can take this time to really become creative through the process of inquiry. So I will pass it on. Thank you, Maria. Anna Maria, that was so, so well oh, elucidated. I'm sorry, I added pictures, Diana. Can I share my pictures? Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to add some images too. I'm a visual learner myself. Um, and I wanted to add some pictures of what it looks like when, after I've de-schooled my mind, right? And I, after I've welcomed um, creativity in terms of how we learn. And so here my youngest child is playing with slime. This is a slime that she created after she's tried to do slime 80 times, 80 different recipes, some in which she's ex explored a recipe that she saw online or somewhere, and some that she's just brought together. So earlier on, we did the whole science of slime, right? It's a polymer. This is what happens when these chemicals mix. So we did the whole chemistry thing. But now it's about her taking, taking this particular experience of slime and going in all the way in her own pace, at her own time. She doesn't have to journal for us because we're in school. She doesn't have to do a science journal about it. It's all in there. And I see it as she's communicating with me what she's learning. It's all in there. Trust me, the capacity of the mind to hold, especially when we are in a space that is stress-free, a capacity for a, for a mind to hold information is incredible. The second picture is her again. And you can see her there. She has her iPad and she's building a mini dollhouse for her Barbies. The iPad is showing um, the person that she likes to follow on YouTube that teaches her various um, <clears throat> doll house making um, spaces. And she's worked really hard. She, I don't know if you can see there, she, there's a, a bed and she made all the bedding for that. So you can see the space. And I really, I wanna focus on this space, not so much on what she's doing. This space is her creative space. And I can't just clean it after every day because the way that is there right now, there's all kinds of projects, there's all kinds of materials that she's gonna need for her creative process. And if I clean it, then she has to go look for it and she has to pull it out. And that takes away from the time of her already being in this flow. And I'm sure maybe you've heard a tech talk about flow, but flow is actually a really beautiful stage 
And if you can spend this year just encouraging Flo and your family, I'm telling you, when you watch your child in Flo, and maybe you already have seen it, um, it's something really powerful. And so she's right now in a flow, and I cannot interact with it in her space. And we'll clean it together, right? And we have various times when she feels finished. Um, but you can see that that was that. Here's my other child. In the left, she has her cosplay costume that she's working for. Je Jester is the name of this costume. She's working for, um, she's doing it, she was gonna do it for Comic-Con this year. And uh, it's a character that she follows from Critical Role. Um, an incredible community of artists, voiceover artists that came together, played D&D. &D. They started recording on YouTube or Twitch. And now they have a huge following. They have a business. They've become so successful. So she's been following the trajectory of these adults, young adults, creating this whole business. And at the same time as being something that she enjoys. She's learned so much just from following this one community. So Jester's here, she designed, she had to draw the designs. She had seen the picture of Jester, but she had to draw the designs. So you can imagine the math, everything that went into constructing this, and obviously it's still a work in progress. I know I'm over time, guys, I'm sorry. And the second picture is the phyllo dough that she really wanted to figure out how to make. And you guys know how hard phyllo dough is, and you can see her little balls there. And she rolled and rolled until that was done. And so, of course, there was so much that she had to learn to, to figure that out. Here's a 13-year-old son building his own PC. It's a goal that he had. He took care of dogs to save money for it, for his birthday. Um, he figured out how to build it. He's very much into gaming. He's engaged with a community in, game, in gaming world that is very interesting. We are part of it. We understand it. We're always in conversations about all these things that our children are doing. That's why as I'm sharing those pictures, I'm giving you all this information because I've been very present through these processes. And the other picture is him at his free circus program in Trenton, New Jersey. Um, circus, of course, I've read so much research about how circus engages the mind, juggling, right? Where it begins to, to, to connect your brain and in, in, in the different areas of your brain in such a wonderful way that you really can become, your, your brain can expand in various ways. So it's not just a physical exercise, it's, there's really so much development that is happening. Um, but here he is, he loves acrobatics. Um, so yeah, I wanted to share those with you because this is part of de-schooling, right? It's like all of a sudden being able to, to come out of the of the table, the worksheet, um, in that pro in the curriculum, and starting to get creative about how these things can happen in your family. So great, Anna Maria. Thank you. Those personal insights really is what it's all about, and it could look different for every family, as, as different as every child. <laughs> and um, Anna Maria really touched upon um, this curiosity and um, it, you know what your children are interested in you know how are they responding to curriculum and the different structures and really it, taking the time to be curious you know inviting yourself to know more about your child not because you want to teach them but because you generally want to know who your child is and we know especially you know those of us who have have older kids and and uh, and see how much they change and it's like in every new moment there's this aha like who is this person now um, you know and wanting to keep up with those changes and being being aware of who they are and maintaining um, that relationship and so you know what being curious about what their interests are and what makes them feel joy. Um, and I love this word fascinated, be fascinated by who your children are and who they're becoming. And so how in this context of this, you know, stressful transition we're going through, um, you know, I, I, I can share how this curiosity has helped me um, it, with some examples. Like when my kids are on their devices and chatting with their friends for hours and I would like help with the dishes instead you know at, at coming from this place of contraction and need and and disappointment and frustration and like instead of yelling at them as a result and disrupting their focused attention that flow maria and maria was talking about uh this immersive learning process instead of disrupting that i 
invite, you know, my curiosity, this touchstone to go meet them where they are at and discover, hey, there's no way I want to interrupt the complex learning that is taking place. You know, when I'm curious and I, I get wowed by what I discover, it, it, I'm, you know, I can feel that, that chills and that moving uh, feeling of, of that connection of discovering what they are actually capable of. Right, and it's sort of like, oh man, I had it wrong. I was here thinking they were doing this, and they're not doing it. And and it's also, then you know that invites, that really reveals my own ignorance and judgment, which then I use that curiosity to dive into that my own inner process, and it becomes cyclical that way. Using this touchstone of curiosity to let go of shame, judgment, punishment, and control, and in its place discover joy the warmth of connection, you know, that feeling, the goosebumps, I have goosebumps that I was just talking about, being seen for who they are is so validating. And, you know, I'm, I wanna invite you right now to think back on how it would have impacted your life as a child to be met and understood and heard and seen and celebrated in your being who you are not who someone else wanted to be or how you were, you know, you were supposed to behave and, and that, that disruption of like, oh, there's a famous, uh, a, a pretty well-known meme from years ago where like the parent comes in and sees this big mess and oh my goodness, what have you done? And then the child, you know, from their perspective, it's this magical, you know, castle they built. They were an architect, you know, or whatever the story is. So that curiosity um, can be a real touchstone in this process um, to invite that learning to happen and to get us through those, those really tough moments of constriction that um, you know, we all have, so especially now. All right. Um, you may be noticing some themes, some buzzwords that we're all using as we're describing these touchstones and that's not by coincidence it really is part of this philosophy of delving into um meeting your children where they are and validating them for who they are as diana just said um, so in our next touchstone which is to follow joy and chase happiness when you can support the happiness of your children, you create an environment where learning thrives and stress is reduced. How can you partner with your child to build more joy? The first step to creating an environment where learning thrives is to notice how your child likes to spend their free time. Take note of what makes your child light up. What makes them sparkle? When do they enter into a state of flow? Is it while baking or playing Roblox? while skateboarding or crafting or playing the guitar. Whatever it is, join them in the activity if you can. If not, observe them. It can be helpful for you, the parent, to make a list of all the topics that their chosen activity touches upon. Recall the example of snakes that I shared earlier. Your child's love of skateboarding links to physical fitness, physics, engineering, classification, or maybe photography, videography, and fashion as they delve into skate culture, which leads to history and statistics as they learn about their personal skate heroes, etc. Whatever it is that your kid likes to do, wherever they find happiness and engagement, that is where the learning magic is happening. Imagine that your child is a new fascinating friend who you want to discover more about. What do they like and why? What is the minutia of their interest? Can you find resources and tools that they might enjoy exploring in tandem with their chosen interest? If so, put those tools in a place where they can discover them. Don't be disappointed if they choose not to use the tools you've added. There are numerous scientific studies that detail the implications of stress in relation to learning and memory. Recent scientific evidence is telling us that stress around the time of learning markedly impairs memory retrieval and may even impede a person's ability to update memories when presented with new information. Stress in conventional schooling and curriculum can come from a variety of sources, exams, tight deadlines, pressure to perform, 
pressure to conform, interpersonal conflict, coercion to study a topic that isn't of immediate importance to the learner, all of which exert a controlling influence on human learning and memory processes. I won't try and tell you that unschooling is free from all stress, but doing away with curriculum and renouncing the comparison culture that is entrenched in conventional schooling can remove many stressors that hamper natural learning. When we follow our children's joy, we are facilitating learning and leaving the stress of externally imposed benchmarks behind. Right now, with school shutter due to the pandemic, we have an opportunity that we may not have had when school was in session. For one gap year during a pandemic, we can cuddle up with our kids and read or watch TV, play video games, draw, sew, have a Nerf battle, bake, play dress up, memorize the stats of every Beyblade, pretend to be dinosaurs, try hair and makeup tutorials off of YouTube. Literally anything and everything that brings your child joy not only relates to academic subjects and career training, but it provides opportunities for happiness and conversation, which lead to real meaningful, not likely to be forgotten learning. When we follow our children's joy, we are facilitating learning and leaving the stress of externally imposed benchmarks behind. Thank you, Lisa. Um, children are your guides. Children are born with amazing communication skills. They will always let you know what they need. Uh, whether it is a tantrum in the grocery store, <laughs> Or, or they need food, they will let you know. Take this time to listen to their needs and expand the possibilities through communication for how you can meet those needs together. Oh, there's so much I could say about children are your guides, truly. Um, through following my children, I've learned my short Ah, uh, Maria, you just froze, honey. Yeah. Maria, you might have to uh, log out and back in again if you're going to continue to be frozen. I'm expecting you. Oh, there you go. You were frozen. Could you just oh. remind about a, a couple sentences? Ah, uh, my internet is unstable. <laughs> Uh, can you hear me? Oh, that's too bad. Okay. She's the one doing the, the slideshow too. But um, we can jump ahead and come back to children are your guides. Um, so while Maria adjusts her technology there. We've had been having a lot of technical gremlins, I have to say, getting started on here even before everybody joined us. So, so that happens sometimes. So communication is the next one. Um, strengthening mindful communication. Learning to practice listening. Because we don't always have the answers and that is okay. Hi, Maria. I just jumped ahead to the next one. Okay, great. Um, and we can backtrack. Thank you. Um, you know, so th this, this is right in, in alignment with what we're talking about, just ways to reduce stress um, so that learning can happen um, and be integrated into, into the bodies and minds of our children and ourselves. Um, more fluidly and with ease um, is to let go, you know, part of that de-schooling of letting go of the idea that we always have to have the answer. The truth is we don't, right? So let's stop pretending we do. None of us always have the answer as parents were expected to, but it's okay. You know, we realize when we can have this communication and, and say sometimes, I don't know Let's work through this. What, what are your needs? Um, why are you upset? You know, here's, here are my needs. 
you know, every, we can see everyone's intelligence and come up with creative ways to solve problems and make decisions. And as we practice that de-schooling, being curious and trusting children, we become better listeners and strengthen mindful communication. Um, and one of the great resources that we've talked about and use is, is nonviolent communication. They have some very good uh, easy tools to understand that the need, meeting the need is at the heart of, of conflict. And um, so how it's helped me and why it's important and how it can help during times of crisis. And again, you know, in the context of a stressful situation is that maintaining the bonds of communication, presence and respectful dialogue has, has been a driving, not only been a driving motivator and tool for my parenting, homeschooling, non-schooling journey toward joy, but by strengthening mindful communication, I avoid those pitfalls of the parent-child relationship and I protect my children too. Um, when I see them as whole persons and practice regarding them as such, we find our way through some intense feelings without damaging our relationships. So that, you know, I, I, it's, for me, it's insurance that they will come to me when they're having a harder time in, in the future, when they're not in my home or as teenagers. Um, everyone in my household is an HSP, a highly sensitive person. <laughs> we are all passionate about justice and rights and, uh, and really all children of unschoolers are because they grow up knowing that, um, you know, they, they have a, a well, when a right is infringed upon <laughs> unconsciously or out of frustration, they feel and know that that is, is not right. Something's out of balance and it can get heated very quickly without the use of mindful communication tools in my house. Um, so add to the mix, the added stress and fear around the current crisis and we can easily fall back into patterns of oppression and control without the ability to find creative ways to solve problems and make decisions that work for the entire family. Beautiful, thank you. Let me go back. My apologies for falling out. I have bad internet in this space, but this is the only clean space right now in my house, so you have to forgive me. <laughs> okay, so going back to children are your guides. Um, I'm gonna kind of run through it a little quickly. I wanted to bring back this idea of inquiry and curiosity, right? So you went through the discounting process, um, you used some of those, some that touched on to, to sort of get prepared for this year. The inquiry is gonna, the inquiry that you do together is gonna help you create a learning environment. And that learning environment ha has a few different areas, right? It has a few different arms. One, the learning environment is the relationship that you have with your child, which is sort of connected to what Diana just talked about, you know, that communication, that partnering, them knowing that you are nurturing presence in their life. The learning environment also has your relationship as a collective. Who are we? What are our goals? How do we want to go about this year? How do we want to use this time? And the learning environment also has, as you saw with uh, my youngest, uh, her craft room also has spaces. And I know Lisa talked about this a little bit, but I was remembering when my son was two and my oldest was um, four, my son was just like all over the place. He would climb anything. And my daughter was just like gentle, wanted to sit and draw all day. And just their, their energies would come together and they would have like a good 20 minutes, but then it was totally different people. And I was remembering that at that time, the way that I used that tenant of, of the learning environment or that, that practice of, of thinking of my learning environment was that I moved out all the furniture from the living room. I just moved everything out, anything that could get damaged. And I just basically had bare floors. Um, I began to build with the furniture that I could use or things that I would make just out of boxes or whatnot. Places where my kids can go under, go over, um, some people put um, swings or hammocks inside their, inside their living rooms, you know. So part of the learning environment is thinking about how you can create a space within your home where children can feel free. Free to explore, free to lay, if they want need to lay for two hours. Um, free to have the, that feeling of 
eating in this space and there's not like a constriction rule that oh we only eat here but just like freedom to to use this space as the learning environment so that they can become comfortable with that space so that was actually really um particularly it particularly worked well when my children were younger we did a lot of messes in that space i would put a whole canvas out and we would just paint or i remember we would do water play inside that space with like a little kitty pool <laughs> Trust me, it was wild. <laughs> but, um, but I know that that really allowed them to think creatively about how to use their own spaces as well. So I wanted to talk to you about that in terms of children are your guides because once you create a, a learning environment where they feel able to, then they're gonna bring to you even more information. And once you have that set up, then you can go into deeper inquiry with them. And part of the inquiry is going to be observing your children. And this is where they really become your guides, is at the level of observation that you have. So I know that we, as we're speaking to you, I know that we're speaking to you from the experience that we have right now. And it may feel like a far leap for, when you, for where you are. So I want to acknowledge that. And I don't want to sound that we, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really want you to take away that we're preaching at you something that is incredible, that we found the, the, the golden nugget. Um, no, we understand where you are. You have your own goals for your family. You have your own um, ideas of, 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 of success and how you want this to work. But if you have the opportunity this year to take a pause, as Lisa mentioned, like sort of this gap year, um, you are gonna find that your children are gonna act, are gonna open up to you in new ways through that trust that Deanna was talking about. They're gonna begin to trust you in a new way and they're gonna begin to feel more comfortable expanding within themselves, getting to know themselves um, and bringing that information to you. And that's where the guidance really comes, is when the child feels so grounded within themselves within who they see as themselves to bring to you. And then together you can get to places that are um, quite useful. So let me just use an example in terms of the place that you might be at right now. Say your child really enjoys chemistry in school and only knows how to explore it through this particular teacher, through this particular curriculum. What can you do in your first transition months to continue to support that interest? And then what can you do in the next few months to step back a little bit and let the child guide that interest? And what can you do towards the end to hopefully by then we are um, more able to move around in our communities? And we, of course we don't know what's gonna happen, but what can you do then to um, match your child with mentors or or, find, or go to the Liberty Science Center, for example, if you're in New Jersey, or begin to, um, to create relationships for your child that expands um, the learning of chemistry for them. But that would only come from observing how your child is relating to this particular subject. Maybe they're not into math. And so what is that gonna mean? Does that mean that your child is saying, I can really only do 10 minutes of math a day and only when you're giving me your full attention. So if you have three kids, that might have to be at eight o'clock when everybody else is sleeping. That's when you might give your child those 10 minutes. And so really work with your child by observing your child, but really understanding what they need and then breaking the barriers that you might have about how things need to work at certain times. Oh, I wanted to share with you. I did put a picture here. I wanted to share with you my daughter's art. And in terms of uh, the learning space, I wanted to share that when my daughter was eight, she wasn't a reader yet, but she would lay in a couch upside down, like literally legs up, upside down for a whole hour, for weeks, I saw this happening. And as an educator, I freaked out. I was just like, oh my gosh. What am I doing? I'm failing. My child is totally going to be <laughs> illiterate. Um, but she would, during that time, what I didn't understand is that she was in flow, but in her mind. And then later on, it came to pass 
that what was happening is that she was creating worlds. She was creating characters. And I wanted to share this picture here because when she became a reader and when she became a writer, it was an explosion, an explosion of ideas, characters, worlds. To this day, this is, this is where she functions even best. That's why she's so into Comic-Con, for example. Like this cat is an extension of where they started in the couch. And so this piece she made for the Black Lives Matter movement, because as a young black woman, she was experiencing this in a very personal way. Um, and she decided that she wanted to take a previous character that she did when she was 10 and bring it to, to where her skills are now. And so this is mostly self-taught um, digital art. And then she wrote this poem. She's never been to a poetry class. She's never, um, she's done some poetry reading and she's been exposed to poetry in various ways. But this is the way that she chose to express. And what I wanted to say is that this is her guiding herself. This is her guiding herself, figuring out how she's gonna deal with this moment, this very deeply impacting moment in her life, in the world, and, and present it out of herself. So this is her, guiding us in terms of figuring out how to support her as well. Oh, so we did this, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Anna Maria. That your, your, your descriptions and personal, uh, you know, observations of the ch children are really, I think, ho you know, hopefully everybody feels that way useful. Um, so yeah, we'll, we just got a couple more to get through, um, real quick. And then, um, we're a little behind schedule. We wanted a whole half hour for our Q and A, but we just got some resources to share with you and then we'll just open it up. And I invite you to type in your questions as they occur to you in the chat. And, um, yeah, let's just continue. We got two more touchstones. I, um, I wish I had some photos to share because even just during this past months of quarantine, we have emptied our living room of furniture and we installed an aerial yoga hammock on a pivoting um, mount from our ceiling. And at some point in the day, there is always somebody either swinging or twirling or like pretending they're Tarzan through the center of our living room. <laughs> because right, part of this is our home is it's not just a home, it's your art studio, your wood shop, your chemistry lab, your, you know, it's basically a big clubhouse. It functions as like a container for everything that your family is into. Um, and as you go along this path of not school, um, it can be really important to build a support community, to begin building relationships with people who support your choice to explore a new learning journey, a place where you can share and exchange resources, find a mentor, create a book club, maybe build a learning pod. Um, you can reach out to us, the Unschooling Squad, and ask us questions because we are here to support you. Um, yeah, ask questions through Facebook and we're also on Instagram. Um, even though the three of us have been unschooling or homeschooling to unschooling our children for many years, we still we form this group to support each other because it's really important to have a sounding board of someone who is going through a similar experience as you, someone who understands your goals and hopes for your family, particularly when they don't match up with those of a conventional schooling paradigm. Um, pivoting away from conventioning schooling and its expectations of how children should learn can be really challenging doing the work of self-examination that is necessary for parents to do in order to be the best support that they can be um, for their children, to encourage their innate capabilities to learn about the world they live in, can be much easier when you have support from others, maybe someone who has more experience living in this way, or at least someone that you can have camaraderie with as they're starting out on a similar path. Um, Yes, the Unschooling Squad began as a, as a support group for the three of us. We decided that we would uh, read a book and meet in person once a month to discuss what we had read and the ways in which we strive to apply the unschooling philosophy in our daily lives. We shared our struggles, 
held each other accountable for positive change and learned together. We thrive and benefit from each other's authentic acceptance, encouragement, and support, just like our children do. We understand one another as we are all on a journey to shift the educational paradigm from one of control to one of trust and freedom. I just want to note that everyone is going to be doing this gap year differently, which I think is amazing. We are all individuals with our own interests, emotions, and energies, so it stands to reason that we each have our own preferences when it comes to living and learning, what we're interested in, how we like to explore it, when we like to explore it. And I think it's really, really fantastic that more people are going to have an opportunity to try and see what living on their own terms, or at least with a little bit more freedom, can look like. That being said, finding a support group can take time. Um, I'd say be mindful if the advice and experience that others share is triggering your anxiety or making hurtful comparisons rise within you. That could be a sign to seek out another support or inspiration. I also wanna mention that it's really important to note that this change is happening for all kids who attended school pre-pandemic. Everyone, the whole country, is going through a seismic shift in education along with everything else that's going on. And when the schools reopen at full capacity, most kids will be coming back after not having attended an in-person school for an extended period of time. Your child will not be at a disadvantage in a system that has not yet been established. Everyone is going to be going back to something new. So I think if you are up for it, this is a really interesting time to try something different with your family. Um, yeah, and I believe in you, you can do it. <laughs> and I think this is a perfect moment to interject also. Um, a, a, another reason for a support community is especially if you're a single parent or, or uh, a family where two parents have to work full time to make ends meet, you need your community, you need your family, your friends, uh, yeah, that support community um, that can help alleviate the, the many roles of, of parenting and working and, um, you know, educate, especially if you're still gonna do some curriculum, um, you know, find, find a, a support community online too that your, your kids can uh, connect with their friends and peers and have, uh, you know, either learning pot or just gaming, just taking that time so that you can have a chunk of time to get your work done. So finding, building a support system for yourself like that, um, too, is really important and, and useful. Yeah, and I think that that brings us to this last piece, which is um, how to understand, to understand fear as a block. So here what we thought of to share with you is that most often it is fear that leads us to not trust our children. Fear blocks our ability to practice all of the previous touchstones. Fear informs how we are in relationship with our children. It shifts us into force, a coercing relationship rather than making them central participants in their lives. I have to be honest with you. I've gone through some of the most scary times during COVID. You know, I, I became sick of COVID. I was so afraid for my family, for myself. I have a child who is immunocompromised. So fear is within us, around us. It is part of our culture right now. Um, so I don't want to diminish that this is where we are. But as you enter into this year, um, and one of the things that has helped me the most in having this support group and um, in my own practice of meditation and other practices that I do to care for myself is to become really aware of how fear um, can block everything in my life. Um, it can turn me into uh, getting kind of angry with the kids or, or sort of snappy at them because there's something that I'm scared about for them or for my family. It can uh, constrict how creative I am about our day or our week or the way we're learning that month. 
um, it constricts the possibilities that there are in terms of how you can learn together. Um, so it really becomes a, a paramount, paramount block as you enter into this time. And so one of the fears that are gonna come up for you is, am I failing my child? Is my child, and as Lisa mentioned, you know, is my child gonna fall behind? I don't wanna answer that question for you. I think that Lisa did a great job giving, you know, alluding to the fact that so many people are gonna be in the same boat as you. But I, what I do wanna focus on is how that fear is gonna prevent you from taking this time as a time of possibility, as a time of growth, as a time where you are learning, especially if you choose to do unschooling, homeschooling in, in, in any way, think about the fact that you're about to engage in a huge learning experience yourself. And as Lisa also mentioned the science, if you're gonna come into this time already with this block of fear, your learning is gonna be hampered. So even, learn, even you learning about homeschooling is already gonna be um, limited by carrying this fear around. So again, I'm gonna bring this, this beautiful practice of inquiry um, as a gift to all of us, especially around fear. So when we are in the state of fear, when fears come up about our, uh, our children, when we are triggered because they don't want to finish the math worksheet and we just feel like, oh, he's going to fail, he's never going to learn math, that's when inquiry needs to come in. That needs to be your guide in that moment. And the main question you need to ask in that moment is, why am I tense? What's happening to me? I'm scared. Why am I scared? And begin that inquiry process within you. Um, and you can even do that practice with your children, right? Like when they're feeling just frustrated, do that inquiry process with them. Do that inquiry process as a family. If there's a curriculum that didn't work out, use inquiry in that moment. Don't just go into fear about this is never going to work really bring inquiry to help you uh, smooth those uh, rough edges that fear really brings to our lives. Because the truth of the matter is, and I think we've all said it in various ways, this is an opportunity. If we can make it, we've already made it to the last few months. It was very difficult. Look at everything that went down in the last few months. We're still here. Our children are okay. I hope that your families have been okay, that you haven't lost anyone in your family. Uh, we're all trying to help our communities in various ways. We made it. And so now we need to be able to, to start this new step with trust and uh, with the awareness of what to do when we feel afraid. Because going into it with fear is really going to push us away from what is possible, but also from our growth as individuals and particularly for your children. This can particularly be a wonderful time for your children to grow. Thank you, Anna Maria. Lisa's gonna go over a few resources. Um, we finished up our, our, our list of touchstones and then we'll just um, ask you to unmute, share your face and, uh, and we'll just be in community and, and answer questions and chat a little bit. So there were just a few resources that we recommended as a getting started. Uh, there's so much to read and listen to um, in terms of unschooling and gentle parenting and self-directed learning. But the, the three that we wanted to share um, was Pam Barikia. She has a free um, ebook, What is Unschooling? Um, Peter Gray's book, Free to Learn, and then we wanted to share Akilah Richards' Fair of the Free Child podcast as places to go to get more information. And as always, we're going to be posting lots more information on our Facebook page and on our Instagram. Um, so if you have any questions. Uh, and we can... Yep, I'll, I'll exit from the... We can copy and paste those resources in the chat so you can just grab those links. Maria, would you be able to do that? Um, yeah, I should be. 
Great. And we'll work on that as we move on to the next thing. I'm trying to, oh, I need to press this button. There we go. <laughs> and um, yeah, if you guys are um, shy or don't have questions, uh, we do have a list of questions that people submitted um, uh, via Facebook that we can answer, but um, you're here now, so if you have questions that either came up during this conversation so far or, um, you know, fears that, that have been pressing that you want to inquire about, I invite you to do that now. And um, if not, we'll just go on and answer some of these questions that came up that are really great questions. Um, and you can always just jump in and raise your hand, um, unmute yourself, turn on your, uh, your video. And um, yeah, go ahead and interrupt us or, or add your question in the chat. Um, so the first question um, that a lot of people have is, you know, if your child is never interested in something that is traditionally taught in school, do you still teach it? Or do you truly 100% follow their lead, even if that means growing up never learning about specific moments in history, for example? And that, you know, relates to the, the fear of like, will I regret not teaching them certain things? Um, you know, why is there such fear behind uh, unschooling you know, or the biggest fear that I have is not learning the basic skills of reading, writing, and math, uh, even though they may not do it in a, in a linear way. <clears throat> so these are all related. And this is such a great, great question. We can get so much out of this discussion. Um, and it's perhaps one of the most common and kind of obvious issues to address when first approaching this way of learning and living. Um, the simple answer is yes, 100% follow the lead of the child. And we talked a lot about that, you know, listening and observing and understanding and knowing to see what motivates or discourages them, the rhythms and the ways they naturally flow when they're learning and their needs are met. Um, but what is more complex about this question is that the language that is used to ask the question is conveyed, um, you know, from within the context of that traditional uh, education and curriculums, you know, following the interests of our children will lead us on such an unexpected learning adventure you couldn't have packaged into a curric curriculum. Um, an example um, that I know from podcasts, um, so I'm, I'm merging a bunch of different actual uh, real life scenarios. Um, is that endless gaming and a passion for anime can evolve into learning how to read, a passion for Japanese history, learning how to speak Japanese, traveling to Japan for an immersive learning experience, and then who knows where that will lead as a way of life for the young adult that emerges from that experience, perhaps a game developer, perhaps an art historian or travel agent. It doesn't really matter. What matters is that pursuing passion and purpose is steeped in joy. And our job as unschooling parents is to support our children's passions and purpose. Learning about moments in history will happen in that context. Unschooling is not about teaching our children, right? So that was the, the word in the, in the question. Uh, learning is always happening. And we talked about that too for all of us, not just the kids. Um, and there are specific moments in history we never learned about in school, but that as self-directed adults, we may have learned ourselves, and so will they. Um, I have something to add. I feel like, you know, this question is really indicative of the, this paradigm shift that happens when you embrace unschooling. Like, conventional schooling, there's a timeline. It's like everything you need to know, you're going to learn it between the ages of 5 and 18 versus unschooling where we know that we are learning over the course of our whole entire lives. And when you learn a thing is not so important as learning what, you, what you're learning and when you're learning. And even now, as we're seeing how much history is everybody learning right now amidst all of this turmoil that is happening um, with, 
the police brutality that's going on. We're learning about Seneca Village, which we never learned about in school. You know, we're learning about the Black Wall Street in Tulsa, which we never learned about in school. I'm 40, you know, I'm learning about new history all of the time. And I went to school and going to school does not mean that you are going to learn all of history. It's impossible to learn everything that there is to learn. So we focus on this idea of loving learning and enjoying learning and immersing ourselves rather than having to learn stuff. And then when you get to be 18, you kind of try and turn it off because you did all the learning that you had to do. And now you're free to live your life. For us, living is learning. And to add to that too, I, I just want to remind us that um, a lot of the times we are under stress in a school setting, right? There's a, there's a limited time in which you can learn something. There, and, and as teachers too, I mean, being a teacher, I know this, you know, like you had to plan your curriculum for this amount of time. Sometimes you didn't get through everything. Um, it was rushed, but then you started teaching to the test, which is another whole process, right? And so children have to go through all these tests. And so I want to remind us that all of that is stress. This is called stressors. And we already have understood through this talk that stress hinders learning, hinders memory. So even if you get to learn about um, this, um, the Civil War in the US or some geography, if it's under stress because you are trying to meet the, the test that is happening in a month or two, how much of that are you gonna retain? And so that's the question of the science, right? And so um, my husband is actually really gifted at this where he always introduces things to our family in a way that he's not forcing us to do something. Like he has something to teach today. No, like one day he, he got the, um, a game called Maria, which is a game about Queen, Queen Maria from Austria. And because he's really into these kinds of board games and he, he just wants to share with us. And the game mechanics are like really intense. And, and we learn about all of us, you know, even my eight year old is getting in there, you know, and, and she might not, it might not hold her attention the whole time, but it's just introducing us to something. Will the kids be interested in following more? Maybe not, but they found that there was this woman there were all these other countries around her that wanted to take over when she was queen. And we found out that in this game, you can actually win as the queen. <laughs> so there are various ways, that, just adding that, there are just various ways and you, you can introduce things that you are interested in or that you found that it would be something nice for your child to know. Um, my children have heard about something when they were a certain age and then remembered it later and inquired about it much later. And then we dove into it much later, like, and I mean years later. Um, but why do they remember that? Because they were under a, a space that was nurturing and that wasn't um, pushing them with all this stress to, to have to, that was evaluating them too, because evaluation, believe it or not, I mean, you know it from your own work, um, in the various jobs that we've held, when you are being evaluated, it's, it's a stressor. Um, we could talk about so much of this for so, so long, and there were a few other questions that came in on Facebook, but Gwen just now asked one that's really pertinent for the here and now um, for, for all of us. Do you have a suggestion of activities for socializing near or around us? I would like my son to continue to meet friends. Do you mainly rely on virtual events at the moment? Um, this has been a struggle uh, for, for this uh, uh, current restriction and um, slowly we've been expanding our bubble and, and um, we went to the beach and just with small groups um, meeting at the park. And we actually have been talking about um, and not least, actually, I'll just pass it to you about getting together with unschooling groups meeting in the park. Um, um, well, yeah, we're not, I don't know if I'm ready for this yet because I'm still wary of, you know, being sick, but we as an, as the unschooling squad, we do want to host a monthly park date where we can meet with other unschoolers or people who are exploring unschooling. Um, to get together. In the meantime, I would say my friend, my children are socializing through um, Facebook and Kids Messenger, 
And my youngest son just recently started um, chatting with people in Roblox because he, you know, he doesn't see his friends. And it's been this whole wild adventure of, yeah, meeting people and playing with people in games that he doesn't know. And it, it is socialization. It's obviously not the in-person kind where you're playing a physical game or a board game or doing whatever you do together, but it still is socialization. And I find that through technology, my kids are actually handling it a lot better than I am. <laughs> um, uh, I noticed we have another question about how do you get family husband to trust the process? My husband gets the idea of homeschooling slash unschooling, but still feels our kids should eventually go back to school. I have something to say about that. Look for that. Um, Thank you, Alex. This is a great, great question. It's being asked a lot. Um, number one, really spend a lot of time together as a partnership, just learning. You know, you may listen to podcasts, share some of these resources, um, really just go through, because you both are learning, right? You both are learning how to do this as a collective. So I, I do feel like um, taking this leap together and getting to that place where you can make that choice together is really important. Um, the going back to school after having sort of this idea of a gap year, for example, or um, just feeling like you are not doing what you were, or your child is not doing what they usually were doing. I wanna tell you that a lot of children, particularly unschooled children, do extremely well when they go back to school. Um, and the main reason, and we didn't talk about this a lot, I think, um, is that your child begins to trust themselves as a learner. Um, and so when you unschool for a long period of time, you actually get to know yourself as a, as, as a learner primarily. You get to know how you navigate information, how you gather it, how you relate to it, how you are with it, how you use it. Um, you become very strategic as a learner. So a lot of kids that return to school after having sort of this nurturing kind of environment where they feel trusted, where they've gotten to engage with their interests, do extremely well because they begin to understand the mechanics of learning in a different way. Um, so we, we have friends, I have friends who have um, children who have gone back to school, middle school, high school, at various points, whenever they express interest. And a lot of the times was social, and a lot of the times was just like they wanted more structure, more stimulation. And the beautiful thing is that they're making this choice. And because they're making that choice, the drive that they have as they go back is incredible. I mean, they become club leaders. They end up, end up in honors classes. Um, they go to amazing colleges and colleges are actually really, um, this was said in another Q and A that was part of, which I, I wanted to remind us too, that colleges are really hungry for people who are loving the experience of being in those spaces. And a non-schooler that chooses or a homeschooler that's choosing to go back to these environments is actually so exciting for colleges, right? Because they're like, oh my gosh, this person really wants to learn. So hopefully that answers your question. That it's gonna be fine. <laughs> Any other questions? Another question um, that came up uh, on, on Facebook was, I question my drive slash energy slash motivation to provide my kids with the opportunities to learn essentially what I end up doing my own thing while they play Minecraft or watch TV 12 hours a day. Another great question because we all have different learning styles and well, you know, teaching styles, but t styles of, of relating, you know, sharing space and, and communicating information, I think. My, my initial instinct to answer this question is, again, from that viewpoint of curiosity um, and, and trust, right? Um, you know, it, it basically use all those touchstones we've talked about and you will find your way and trust that, well, yes, so what if they spend 12 hours a day doing TV or Minecraft, you know, you might find that they actually are doing a lot more than what you think they're doing. Um, they, especially the older ones, watching them um, 
you know, communicate and troubleshoot and navigate, you know, really doing complex, uh, you know, strategizing and, and, and just the joy <laughs> that they have, you know, laughing. It's really learning to collaborate, which is so important for, for the future of our society, <laughs> you know, um, and, and such a great skill in any job that they may end up, you know, uh, navigating to make a living. I know we're getting close to the end, but I just want to add to that question and what she's asking, which I think is really like a very um, observant kind of question, because I, as an unschooler, I have to say there are waves or it ebbs and flows. Like there will be times where while we're all in the same house, we are all doing our own separate thing. And then there are times when we are all together or I'm spending a lot of time with one child. And when I feel disconnected from my kids or like we've spent too much time apart, the easiest way I have found to connect with them is to join them. So I do not love video games, but I have a Roblox account and I have a Minecraft account and I will play those games with them. And it's hysterical because I'm so bad at them and they immediately are in hysterics over just the, the word is a noob, how much of a noob I am at these games. But it's also like an immediate connection. And I find that I can dip into 30 minutes of a video game with them and that feeling of we've been separate all this time or have I done enough really disappears because one, I see how hard those games are and how hard they're working at them. And even if they're spending, like Deanna said, 12 hours a day on Minecraft, that is 12 hours of some dedicated learning, working, strategizing, like so much learning. And you know what? If I had been trying to direct them for that time, they probably would not have learned nearly as much because I'm not a teacher. I don't want to be a teacher. And as we've discovered through all these talks, even though if you might be teaching somebody something, unless they are choosing to learn it, they're not learning it. Um, so yeah, yeah so we have so much to say about that. So maybe yeah. we'll expand on that. Maybe we can take that question and sort of maybe do a Q, you know, just do a, a conversation around that particular question because I think it's so rich. I know yeah. we're coming to our end. And it is 8.30 now, but we have one more question. Um, is everybody who's on right now able to stay for another 10 minutes? Are Anna Maria and Lisa, you're okay with that? Yeah, I can do 10 more minutes. So the question is, what were the experiences for anyone with pre-literate kids? How did you help your kids start reading? Um, I bought so many books of how to teach kids how to read, like when they were two, you know, and one. Um, and I actually never really got to, we did end up, you know, enjoying Bob books, which is just such, you know, some people hated it, you know, but our kids really liked the, the cute uh, drawing illustrations and the simple stories. And, um, but really, hands off they 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 my one eldest learned on her own by four you know and we read a lot we're a very literate you know family we read read just you know we would take out 50 books each for a week i just let them come home with as many books on their own cards and um just by by being around that but then also by gaming and by being you know, my other eldest, I mean, uh, daughter is, is nine and is, is becoming a reader now. So really very different. And part of it was her resistance because she was more sensitive to being grilled by, you know, uh, family members who, you know, it's, it, it's part of the culture, you know, testing. And, and she resisted that. Um, so in, in short, just being present and reading a lot and, and not pushing. I used to, with my eldest, trace the, the words as I was reading. My youngest, she didn't want to have any of it. She directed me to unschool her. So we didn't do any schooling and she's just picking it up on her own and, and, and asking 
to to learn when she is interested and, and ready. Um, I want to share that my son actually learned to read um, from Pokemon cards at age eight. So both my oldest and, and middle learned to read um, at eight. And um, from pre that, so what did it look like before that? It looked like me biting my nails off, being super afraid. <laughs> my children were never going to read, and particularly with my first. But as an educator myself, when I saw her transformation, when I saw her um, finally getting to this place, which she felt the need to read. So she acknowledged that there was something that she really wanted to do that she was really interested in, and she wanted to use that tool. And when that clicked in her brain, it took less than three months. And from then on, it was, like Diana said, stacks and stacks of chapter books. Um, so I had no problem with her becoming a reader. She's an incredible writer now. She writes amazing stories. Um, and with my son around Pokemon cards, it was because he wanted to win. And he realized that if he didn't know how to read the cards, he was gonna lose. And that's a no-no for my son. He needs to win whenever he's playing something. And so he took that drive, that interest, and turned it into, oh, I need this tool. And so I know this is, this, this, this is from a privileged perspective because we're all educated, right? I have a master's degree. My husband is educated, college level. So I know that it's, that it's from a privileged perspective. Not everybody is able to do this, right? I, I come from an indigenous community. If we didn't have schools and places where we can learn to read, it might be difficult because not everybody, my father wasn't literate, you know? Um, so I want to acknowledge that, that this is an important piece this idea of literacy. But if your environment is a nurturing learning environment with all the people that live there, especially the adults, are literate, they know how to read, then one of the things that you can do is read things aloud for them, whether it's a book or a recipe or something that you saw that, that is, you don't even have to point so they follow. You can just read it out loud. Or you can play games in your car. Hey, what is STOP? Just for fun, not even to like, push them to learn just for fun. Bring up games in your car, bring up games at all times. If you have time in the evenings to sit with one of the children that you really wanna spend more time with, maybe it's something that you do um, around literacy. But also remember that literacy is happening all the time, that it's not just through, the, through reading work. You know, literacy is happening as, they, as they're understanding words, as they're listening to languages, um, yeah, or yeah. They're interested in, if they're interested in cars and, you know, they're, they're recognizing letters on a license plate, it can right. be that, that, and, and you mentioned storytelling until, you know, they learn to read, they, they, you can still, they can still write a book, be, you transcribe their, you know, record That's their right. stories and, you know, they're still creating, they're still uh, using words and, and developing language. Absolutely. I just want to add one piece. Um, when you're unschooling, the need for a certain skill to be learned at a certain time really gets thrown out the window. There's no need. In school, the whole process of teaching revolves around children learning, right? A teacher at the front of a classroom with 25 kids, those kids need to be able to read. And if they can't, there's a lot of shame, but then they also are left behind in all of their subjects because the whole curriculum, the whole process is based around reading. And with unschooling, we are learning, kids are learning from all sources. They're learning from YouTube. They're learning from being read to. They're learning from trips to the museum, trips to the playground. And like Maria and Diana have said, there is literacy in everything. Um, none of my children were taught to read and they all have wildly different like time frames for reading and ways that it happened. My middle child was one of those kids who seemed as if she wasn't reading at all and then the next day she was literate and there was no fanfare. She never was like, I want to learn how to read. It was never something so obvious. It was one day we were at the museum and I said, oh, would you like me to read this placard for you? And she was like, actually, I can read the whole thing by myself. And that was just it. Like, oh, all of a sudden you can read. But for my kids, I'd say the main, I read to them whenever they asked. We read lots of books from the library. I read chats, I read video games, I read texts, all sorts of things. I remember reading the names 
of all of the My Littlest Pet Shops and their descriptions over and over and over and over again for them. But really what made them make that boundary, that big leap was gaming and wanting to be able to read the chats and respond. And I just wanted to put that out there because I know a lot of people are kind of a fearful of screen time, but for my kids, that was really the most direct driving force for reading and writing was, was participating in chats. Speaking of fear, um, Vika says, my biggest fear is that if I unschool my kids, they won't show any interest in anything. My almost four-year-old has no interest in traditional learning like numbers, letters, drawing, or any art. She won't listen to a book and wasn't receptive to any classes of different formats we tried. Um, I don't know that this applies to you, but um, it needs to be said and addressed that uh, really sometimes our kids resist because they feel the pressure of our coercion, of our fear. So, you know, this goes back to um, that self-inquiry and, and looking at our fear and, you know, how those fears might become unconscious dictators of our beliefs and behaviors and we are so used to being attached to these restrictive boundaries and the perception that they need to learn by a certain age at like, oh my God, you know, four year old. And I mean, I remember doing the same thing when my, my kid was about four and I got her a scooter and then she didn't want to do it. And I said, oh my goodness, she's, she's going to give up so easily for the rest of her life. She's not going to pursue until she, you know, masters anything. It's not true. Um, so it's it's untangling those perceptions within us that then can really make a big shift in our relationships. And it's like we are a constellation. We're all connected. So that's that self mining work. But um, uh, can I ask that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Do you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to ask, what does your four year old like to do? There has to be something, whether it's playing dress up or watching the octonauts or um, making mud pies in the backyard. And I would say whatever it is that she likes to do, just do more of that. Do it all the time, as much as she wants to. You know, if it's dress up that she likes to do, add new pieces to her dress up collection. Um, maybe you can find some resources. And I'm saying this as a child who, at four years old, like loved to dress up. That was what we did all day long. And then I would bring in books from the library and show costumes that maybe looked like they were doing. We would draw characters, just whatever it is that, that she likes, just do more of that. And you'll see how it expands over time. I wanted to say that um, there's a lot of science uh, in, in my own uh, coming as an educator when I was in school. Um, there was a lot of science and a lot of written work around learning through play and the importance of play in learning. And of course, Montessori, Reggio Amelia, these are the, uh, Waldorf, these are all philosophies of, edu of education and schools that include play. So particularly for anyone pre-five, but you know, we're still playing in my family, my daughter's 16, but pre-five is when uh, neurologically uh, there's so much connectivity happening. And the studies show that play itself is what allows for that connectivity um, and those synapses to really click. Um, I'm sorry I don't have uh, anything to cite for you, but it's so important that if your child is sharing that these spaces of um, taking a class or sitting down to learn if you're that, like that's data your child is giving you information so you need to use that as the inquiry process so if that's not working that's okay it means that you now start from start over so whether it's inquiry process or like lisa says like create ample spaces for her to explore play just play bring a big sheet into the floor and just throw all the legos you have in the floor and leave it there for a week and see what happens. Um, begin to strew, there's this, called thing, there's this, thing, this um, practice called strewing where you begin to bring things into your space um, of various natures, 
for your child to explore. So definitely um, you have to become a leader in creating that environment where your child feels nurtured with ha without it being, you need to sit for this class or you need to go in this traditional way. So it, it will require some creativity for sure. So I think, are we good? It, yeah, that's a good that to end. Um, it, you know, I just want to say one more thing on fear. You know, we're, we're taught that fear is natural. It is, you know, when we are threatened, um, but it's not natural to live in fear constantly. And the truth is unschooling takes the family on a journey of discovering and letting go of those controls that limit learning. So I want to wish you all um, the very best um, and most fun on this adventure of, of learning and reach out to us at the unschooling squad at Gmail with any other questions um, or even as you are navigating, you know, even if it's a month or two from now. Um, just any time that's what we are making ourselves available for and we will be sharing more uh, videos um, and live chats as well so thank you all for being here thank you we wish you so much wellness and uh, you can do this thank you so much we really appreciate you being here and yeah we're here for you so reach out good night everyone good night squad Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, squad. <laughs>